Okay, students, we're going to have a quick look at Darwin's theory of evolution and the stuff that he saw that got him to thinking while he was in the Galapagos Islands. It's going to move pretty quick because there's a lot to look at and only a limited amount of time that I can record for YouTube. So we look at Darwin's theory and the observations he had, and the first one was the diversity of life. Diversity means having many different species. If we talk about the diversity of your backyard, you'll have earthworms and squirrels and things like that. If we look at the diversity all over the world, there are millions and millions of different species all over the world. Secondly, a species is a group of organisms that can mate and produce fertile offspring. Now remember that a fertile offspring has to be able to have its own babies. So a horse and a donkey having a mule does not produce a new species even though they can have a baby. Those are not members of the same species. Now next, we have fossils. Everybody knows what fossils are, and they show the remains of ancient creatures, and they show us that these creatures have changed from the past, different animals in the past than we have now, and of course many of them have gone extinct. So we see a lot of differences from past creatures to present creatures. And third, the organisms on the Galapagos. The Galapagos is like a laboratory for these kind of changes because it's so isolated and so small and controlled. It's a very, very rough place to live, so the creatures that live on the Galapagos have had to change quite a bit to deal with the very, very adverse conditions there on those islands. So, we see that these creatures out there are clearly related to the common mainland creatures like the finches and iguanas, but they had changed quite a bit to better fit the island. So more about those creatures is we've got to compare them to the mainland creatures. And the good example of that is the iguana. The iguana on the island has very large claws to grip the rocks, and his skin is very dark to protect from the sun because there's no shade to be found there on the islands. The island, or the uh, iguanas on the mainland, however, have very small claws for scrambling up trees to where they feed on the leaves that's their normal source of food, and their skin is light green so they can absorb more light because they live in the shade of the canopy. Now if we look from one Galapagos island to the next at creatures that cannot switch islands, we see the founder effect, where the first animals that landed there gave the traits to their great-great-great-great-grandchildren, so we'll see tortoises on one island with dome-shaped shells, and on the next island all the tortoises will have saddle-shaped shells, because they inherited that from their ancestors long, long ago there on the island. So, move on, we talk about adaptations. It's a trait that helps an organism survive. Any trait that will let you survive and reproduce is a good trait, so we call it an adaptation. Only good traits are adaptations. And of course, it depends on your environment, like camouflage. In the winter, being white is an advantage, because you are camouflaged against the snow. But in the summer, being a white animal in Arkansas is a disadvantage. So what's an ad adaptation in one environment may not be an adaptation in another environment. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Now, we talk about the finch beaks. The finches are highly adapted for specialized foods. So we'll see certain food or certain beaks are very, very big to crack the very toughest seeds there that nobody else can eat. So that finch has a specialty that gets him food nobody else is going to be trying to get. Others will have tiny beaks for fish and bugs out of cracks. And we'll see other modifications like middle-sized beaks for eating certain types of seeds or perhaps feeding on cactus fruit. And we'll move on, oops, a little more to the slow change of the species over time, which is evolution. Remember, this takes, you know, thousands to millions of years, so this is a very slow process. It does not happen in the lifetime of a single animal. So it is a theory, but a theory is a very well-tested uh, observation that explains a wide range of events. Not just one or two events, but lots of things can be explained by this theory. It's well tested, has been tested over and over and over and over again, it has not been conclusively disproved, but has been shown to explain many, many things, from the antibiotic resistance of the germs in your gut, to the coloring of guppies, to a variety of other things, such as the beaks of the finches, and Roundup resistance in our corn, or plants in our cornfields where we're using Roundup. So Darwin reasoned that a small number of plants and animals came to the island and then slowly changed to become better adapted to the island. Now, since humans can change animals, like breed dogs into weird things like Chinese crested hairlesses and chihuahuas and things like that, 
it seems obvious that if we can change animals, then nature can apply pressure to change animals also, and that's what we do see in nature. Natural selection is the process by which nature quote-unquote selects the animals or plants that will be the parents of the next generation. Of course, nature doesn't really have a mind. It just applies forces that cause some to die and some to live. Step one is overproduction, having way more babies than can possibly survive. That's why a grasshopper will have 500 to 1,000 eggs at a time, but only a few of those will survive. All of those babies are different, and that is variation. Some of them will be better adapted, and some will be worse, and that will determine who lives or dies when we get to the competition stage. The organisms compete for survival for like food, water, hiding places, shelter, things like that, warm places to sleep in the winter, and those who lose this competition will die. Those who survive the competition are selected. Those with the best variations survive the competition are the parents of the next generation and pass those good traits that let them survive onto their offspring. So we have overproduction, variation, competition, and selection. These steps are pretty important. Now, environmental change. Now, when the environment changes, it's important to know that the animals are going to need to change as well. So we'll see, say, an area turning into a desert. Animals are going to need to change their camouflage. Or if, let's say, an area becomes very, very dry, plants may need to change to get thicker skins. So what used to be an adaptation and was helpful when the environment changes may not be an adaptation anymore. Something different may be a beneficial adaptation. So there will be a great change where some organisms will die and others will live depending on the new environment. Now genes and natural selection. This is very important. Darwin did not understand how genes are passed on, how traits are passed on. We do understand that very well and it supports his theory very, very well what we do understand about genes and chromosomes now. So, it's important to know that only traits that can be passed on from your parent to your offspring, the traits that are controlled by genes, can be acted on by evolution and natural selection. Things that happen to you in your lifetime, such as eating well, or getting a scar, or something like that, some change in your lifetime, will not be acted on by natural selection. You have to be able to pass it to your kids, and just like tattoos and scars, you cannot pass your good exercise routine or your good diet on to your kids. That's something you have to teach them and hope that they've got the good genes as well. Now, evolution does not work in the lifetime of one organism. It works over the lifetimes of many, many organisms, and I'm talking about thousands to hundreds of thousands of generations we see slow, slow changes. Now, we will see natural selection work fairly quickly in uh, situations where the environment is changing, but not usually in the lifetime of one or two or even three organisms. It takes a long time. So you'll see these changes occur slowly. But if you're very observant and you spend a lot of time out in nature, you probably will see these changes occur if you're paying good attention. So that's the end of this section, which is section one of chapter five on Mendel's theory. And soon I will have the next one, chapter two on evidence evolution. Or sorry, section two.